I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to, this morning to Ephesians chapter 5. I had some things that I had to add yesterday to, to try to open this message correctly. And this morning what I want to talk to you about is your reflection. Your reflection. What others see in you, do others see Christ in you? Okay? Your reflection. So let's read verses number 1 and 2, Ephesians chapter 5. Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sweet, and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, we praise you. Lord Jesus, even as that pastor today, this morning, Lord, he read some, or he uh, mentioned some things when he prayed this morning. And Lord God, that fits right in with what we're going to preach today. He didn't know that, but Lord, you knew that. And you guided him on what to say when he prayed this morning. And God, we pray, Lord Jesus, you would guide us, direct our heart, direct our tongue, Lord, our words, Lord God, let it be uplifting to you, Lord Jesus. And we just give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. And everybody said, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Now, I said I want to talk to you about your reflection. I want you to look at verse number 1 in Ephesians 5. It says, be therefore followers of God. What does that word follower mean? Does anybody ever look it up to see? Well, good. You're going to get a little Bible lesson this morning. That word follower means imitator. Imitator. We're supposed to imitate Christ. I only heard one amen. That's right. We're supposed to look like he looks. Yes. We're supposed to act like he acts. We're supposed to talk like he talks. Yeah. Sometimes we don't. Now I'm just talking about me this morning, okay? You talked about yourself then. Praise the Lord. Yes. I found out that the word followers is uh, listed eight times in the word of God. And seven, seven of them is defined as imitators. I think when the Lord places a word in his word that says the same thing over and over and over again, I think he's trying to get the attention of the church. I think he's trying to get the believer's attention so that we will understand we are supposed to be like Jesus. Amen. One big difference, he was without sin. We fall short. How many's ever fallen short before besides me? Remember, you're in the house of the Lord. Don't lie. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we're supposed to imitate Christ. When we open our mouth, everything that we say. Now, I'm going to talk about some things I've heard others say. And sometimes, occasionally, things that may have even come out of my mouth. Boy, did it get quiet when I said that? Yeah, yeah let's, let's hear about you, Tim, but don't talk about us. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, if the shoe fits, praise the Lord. Yes. When we open up our mouth, we have to sound like Jesus would sound if we were standing right here now. Yeah. Would he criticize people? Come on, help me. Yeah. No, he would not criticize people. Would he love people? Yeah. Yes, unconditionally. Yes. Amen. And so when we think about the life of Christ, one thing that Jesus had much of, and that was compassion. When he saw someone hurting, he was wanting to do something about it. Many of us have seen people on the street that are hurting, but we've never moved in that direction to help them. Now see how quiet it got when I said that. That's the truth. When we see someone down and out, we should help them. Come on, amen. Amen. Are you willing to do that? Jesus would. So our actions should point directly to everything that Christ is all about. Things that he did do and things that he still does today. What our actions should prove is that we are a follower of Jesus. Yes. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So Christ was all about love. Isn't that right? And that should be the theme of our lives, loving people. The Gaithers sing a song, and one of the uh, uh, lines in there says, loving God, loving each other. Listen, you can't just love God and not love people. If you love God, you're going to love others. Hello? 
Y'all here this morning? Yes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. So we should be walking and talking about love. Yes. Amen. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. Listen to what he said. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let me tell you something. If we preach the cross of Jesus everywhere we go, that should be sufficient. Amen. That's right. Preacher, you and I will talk this yeah. morning. Amen. Yeah. That's it. We should be talking about the blood of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice that he made on Calvary's cross for you and me. Do we in our lives reflect that? Okay, now that's just the foundation. That's just something I had to write down yesterday when I was over in that hotel room. So I want you to turn now to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 12. And I want you to see from the word how that we're supposed to be so much like Jesus and never forget that we're supposed to be so much like Jesus. Amen? How many is there? 1 Corinthians 13. Verse number 12. For now we see through a glass or a mirror darkly. Yeah. It's Right now it's just a blurred reflection. But then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know and understand fully and clearly, even as also I am fully and clearly known. Now when we look at chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, the first word that we think about with this chapter is four letters beginning with the word or the letter L yep. ending in E with an O and a V in the middle. That's right. This is called the love chapter. Right. Amen. Yep. And when you read that, you find out that there's detailed uh, explanation of the significance and the power of love. There is power in love. Yeah. Amen. amen. Come on. Amen. Amen. God's love was shed abroad in the earth yeah. so that you can be at this church today doing what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And sometimes we have to be uh, rooted on. Sometimes we have to have a cheerleader to get us going in the right direction. I didn't want to feel like a cheerleader this morning, but I felt the song, and I was sitting there like a bump on a pickle. I wasn't doing a whole lot of nothing. Yeah. But I noticed that everybody else was about doing the same thing I was. Yeah. I said, it's time to change this thing. We may not have much that song said, but we have a praise. Yes. We have a worship. Yes. Come on. We have Christ's love dwelling on the inside of us. His love that we're giving away to others freely. Like he did when he went to Calvary's cross, right? So love is the motiva motivating force behind all ministry in the church. Now, I know that there are some churches that have 10, 12, 20 some different ministries coming out of the church. Yeah. And let me tell you something. If every one of those ministries are not operating in love, if love isn't their central theme about that ministry, you're missing the emphasis of what that ministry is there for. That's correct. We pass out food. We give out food. Some places give out clothing. Yeah. Some pro provides a place for shelter. They do that because they love their fellow man. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Yeah. That's not saying that they compromise or not saying that they, they love the way they live. That's not what we're saying. We love them in spite of. Yeah, that's right. I mean, Jesus looked at me and said, hey, Big Tim, I love you in spite of yourself. Yeah, that's true. Amen. Now, I put my name there, but you throw your name there. Yeah. Yeah. God loved you in spite of who you are. Yeah. He looked, like the song says, he looked beyond your faults. He saw your needs. Yeah. And what did he do? He began to love you. Yeah. So the word uh, for love is charity. And it's used nine times in chapter 13 here in, in Corinthians. Now that's something that should get our attention. God's talking about love as the emphasis of chapter 13 in, in this book of Corinthians. Yeah. Amen. And there's another word in the Greek. It's called agape. How many's ever heard agape? Yes. Amen. Agape is a love focused more on giving than receiving. That's true. That's what it means. Let me tell you something how that actually works. When you're willing to give, God willingly gives you more back than you can ever think to give. Amen. 
Amen. I remember when I was uh, laid off from the steel mill and my uh, uh, unemployment ran out in Ohio. They said, well, you're from West Virginia. You can go draw it from West Virginia. So I did. <laughs> I was going to get $35 a week. I had a wife. I had a home. Had three babies. Now, how's that going to work? Now, let me just tell you this. I sort of got in the flesh a little bit. I wanted to go across that table after that person said, we're going to give you $35. I said, real big of them, right? And we saw a chance, even in the midst of $35 a week, to help others. And people would bring things to us because I was unemployed. I wasn't making a whole lot. And they would bring us groceries in one door. And we would funnel them out the back door to our neighbor who was worse off than us. Worse off than $35 a week. Wow. And every time it came in one door and we pushed it out the other, it continually came in that door. Amen. Amen. Come on. That's God's principle. It is so much more blessed to give than to receive. But let me tell you, sometimes it's fun to try to outgive God. Yeah, because then you, you, you're wondering, do I have to build another big big barn or something to put all this in? I don't have room for it. Yeah. Amen. His yeah. word works. Yes. Amen. Yeah. So we have to learn that agape love is focused on giving more than just receiving. Yes. And thank God that we can receive. Because mm -hmm. if we couldn't receive, we couldn't give. Yeah. Come on. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. People put value on things that they have. We should always learn how to put value on what Christ has done in us. Amen. I mean, when somebody says, you don't have a whole lot. Let me tell you something. When I went to uh, Africa, I went there for 15 days by myself. I'd like to go back again, but I'll never go back by myself. That was a long 15 days. I'm the only American there. Can't understand Swahili. I'm trying to learn it, but it was difficult. And while I was there, I found out how that those people that had absolutely nothing, they would walk for hours to come to where the meetings were at. Wow. Yeah. And sometimes I know people living across the street from a church and won't even walk across the road to go to church. Yeah. Yeah. And they walk for hours because they're hungry for what God is about to do in their life. And so they have nothing, but they have Jesus. They have everything. Yes. Come on, amen. Jesus is the majority yes. over everything. Amen? Right. Praise the Lord. Right. So we shouldn't value on stuff that we have. We should value on what Christ has done in us and what he wants to do through us to manage what he's done in us to be able to reach others. Right. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. How many's ever thought about you know, you're walking down the street, you see somebody with some uh, tennis shoes with holes in it? I was going to say jeans with holes in them, but they all do today. <laughs> and they cost more than the ones without the holes. Yeah. So what you ought to do is buy the ones without the holes, cut your own holes, and it's cheaper, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you're walking down the street and you see somebody with uh, bad shoes on, you know uh, it's 10 degrees outside. It was 18 degrees when we drove here Saturday morning. It was 18 degrees. Yeah. I wanted to clean my windows because of all the junk that was on there thrown by trucks. I couldn't because everything froze up in my system because it was 18 degrees. So I had to get out and clean a little spot to see through. Amen. You see somebody walking down the street at 18 degrees and they have holes in their shoes. You know they've got to be cold. Take them to the store and buy them a good pair of, of shoes, jeans, whatever they need. Take them to the store and buy them what you would buy for yourself. Yeah, yeah. See, now somebody said, just said, he's meddling. Yeah. Well, let me meddle some more. <laughs> when you see someone hurting and you're not willing to reach out and help them, how does God's love dwell in you? Because isn't that what Jesus would do? Praise the Lord. I'm going to get to where I want to go here in a minute. Yeah. Hallelujah. God has given us nine gifts that we're supposed to be using in our lives. Some could have more than one in operation in their life. Right. Somebody said one time, all nine have operated in their lives. And I thought, well, praise God. Yeah. Not all at the same time. Yeah. 
Praise God. But praise the Lord. We have nine gifts that God gives to us. And he gives us gifts. Why? Because he loves us. Yeah. And he wants us to use what he's given to us. Wouldn't it be a sad thing if somebody gave you a brand new car, you let it sit in the garage and never crank it over and drive it? Yeah. What good would that be? Well, it's the same principle with the Lord. The Lord gives you stuff. And if you're not willing to use it, you know what? He'll use somebody else who will use what he's given to him. And so the gifts that the Lord places in our lives are there for a reason, to help others. Thank you, ma'am. I saw that. Even without my glasses, I could see that. Hallelujah. So we're supposed to operate in the gifts. Our motivation for operating in the gifts is to see somebody's life transformed and changed. The sound man and I were talking earlier this morning back there, and we could talk about a whole lot of things, but you know what? If we decide we want to talk about something in the Word in this area here, and it has nothing to do with someone getting saved, it's a good thing, but really, you know, in the context of things, it's not going to accomplish a whole lot. Why are we here? For people's lives to be changed. We don't need to argue over doctrine. Come on. Yeah. I know people that want to do that. Yeah. And you know what I do? I excuse myself and I leave. Yeah. I don't want to argue doctrine. I don't want to argue anything in the word. I want to tell people about the goodness of Jesus. Because if we're not, I told him, I said, I wonder if the devil's sitting there listening to us bicker over this and that in the word. And saying they're not doing what they should be doing. And there's so many people that need Jesus, but they're not preaching Jesus to them. That's right. We're supposed to be preaching Jesus. Him crucified. That's what Paul said. Amen. Praise the Lord. Paul points out that all spiritual gifts will at some time cease. But they will become unnecessary when the Lord returns. That's like I tell people, you know what? You should get in your word, in, in the Bible, and read it every day. You need to study to show yourself approved. You need to learn what the Word of God says because somebody's going to have a, a need or an issue that comes up. You're going to need a verse of Scripture that you have read, yeah. but if you're not spending time in it, yeah. come on, amen. That's right. And so we're supposed to get into God's Word so that we can share what God has for them. Somebody did that for you. Yeah. 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 I got a little bit more on the same page with me this morning, right now. Amen. Amen. God wants to do something in this earth. I, I love the word that came forth this morning. Let me tell you something. God is never going to leave us out on an island all by ourselves. That's right. Everywhere we go, he's going with us. And most of the time, we, we want him to lead where we're going, right? Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. So even though these spiritual gifts will cease, and even though Bible reading and studying uh, one time, we won't need it anymore. What do you mean, brother? Well, when we get to heaven, we won't need that. Why? Because we'll be standing right before the very word That's of right. God, Jesus himself. That's right. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Paul points that out, and, and he says this. He says, when that which is perfect is come, yeah. we're talking about Jesus. Yes. And the end three things will remain. There are always going to be faith, yeah. hope, and love. But the greatest is love. Yes. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, a little bit more of a foundation. Can we get into the word now? Yes. The light's still red. Yeah. Oh, no, it's not red. Red would be bad, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's still working. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's go back to verse number 12, 1 Corinthians 13. Talking about what? Okay. But what I say in the beginning... I want to talk to you about your reflection. Yes. For now we see, verse 12, through a glass, a mirror. How many's ever gotten in front of the mirror any time this past week? I get in front of the mirror to brush my teeth. I didn't get in front of the mirror to brush my tooth. Yes. My teeth. Yes. Some people say you're from West Virginia or Kentucky around that area. They don't have a whole lot of teeth in their head. I brush them all. Amen. What I have, I brush. Praise the Lord. Yes. I stand in front of that mirror and I look at myself and I have to 
wet my hair down from time to time and comb my hair because it's sticking up all over the place. And I know that's the style. I don't like it for me. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we all have stood in front of a mirror for one thing or another. But listen to what the verse goes on to say. Paul says, darkly, a blurred reflection, but then face to face. He says, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Since this word here talks about the glass darkly, it's talking about a mirror. We have to understand that the mirror is something that reflects us. If we move aside from that mirror, our reflection is not there any longer. Amen. And the Bible says this, says this in James, that a man goes and he looks at him in a mirror and walks away. Listen to this. This is really odd to me. He looks in the mirror, walks away, and forget who he was. How is that possible? Can somebody help me this morning? When you see yourself in the mirror, you know it's you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. When you walk away, you still know what you look like. But the verse of Scripture says that when he goes away, he forgets what manner of man he was. Yeah. Sometimes I think we forget why we're here. Yeah. And I think sometimes we forget what God wants to do through us. There are some things we should never forget. We should always remember God loves. Yeah. And people say, well, now I'm getting off script a little bit here. They said, well, God won't send nobody to hell. You're absolutely right. He don't. He loves people enough. He won't do that. But people end up there. Why do they end up there? Because they send themselves there for denying him. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Christ came to give life, the Bible says, and life more abundantly. He wants you to have some abundant things in him. Come on, amen. Help me out this morning. Amen. Should I stay in bed a little longer? <laughs> Hallelujah. People are always trying to justify our lives as Christians. They look at us and say, well, you're not Christ-like. You don't sound Christ-like. You don't do the things that Christ did. That's true. Sometimes the modern-day church doesn't fit into that category. Come on, amen. They go to church. The Bible says this. There are some that, that come and they say they have a form of godliness, but they deny, deny God's power. You can't separate his power from his love. Are you hearing me? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It's beyond our own imaginations when we think about what God has done and what God is able to do, what God is willing to do, what God wants to do in these last days. How many believe that we're living in the last days? Okay, let me, let me qualify. How many believe we're in the last seconds of time? I believe so. I believe the clock is ticking and Jesus is about to come back. He's going to split that eastern sky. And the Bible says when he comes back, will he find faith in the earth? Will he see that his people were all about loving other people and helping them regardless what it costs to do it? Just recently... This past year, my wife and I had a little bit of a tough time. Our daughter was in the hospital in the month of March twice for surgeries. We weren't home yet. We got home early in April. She had to go back in on the 5th or 6th, the 6th of April. She went in there because she had complications from the two surgeries. She ended up having 12 surgeries. For the same thing. I would have figured that all these guys that had these education going to uh, training and stuff in colleges, that they would have been able to fix it the first time, never fixed it after 12 times, and still had problems after that. And things complicated from just a bowel problem to started to involve her heart and her lungs and other things were involved in They began to shut all those things down. And when that began to, began to happen, 
we were kind of in a quandary. We didn't know what to do except pray and believe God. You know, on the 21st of December, our young daughter Tracy went home to be with Jesus. And at the funeral, I said this. I said, Lord, I thank you for the 51 years, 5 months, and 21 days you loaned her to us. It was difficult. But through all of that, we still felt God's love. We felt God's love and we saw the love of God through other people because we had a son-in-law who could not afford a funeral. And one church gave him $8,000. Wow. Because they said he shouldn't go in debt at a time like this. They wanted to help him. But we also know we go to this church twice every year and minister and they kind of like us just a little bit. And for the love of God in their hearts, they reached out and showed it. Now, some people say, that's too much. It may be for some. Some gave $100. Some gave $500. Uh, they wanted to help. They wanted to show God's love. And we still have questions why things worked out like they did and why things got worse and why, why did she have a bed sore that was big enough to put two fists through, you know, and, and why did she have five infections in her body? It was all about a bowel thing that moved throughout the whole system and eventually took her life. But on the 21st of December, when she closed her eyes, she, she got the most precious and perfect Christmas gift. The Lord greeted her. He held her in his arms and showed her love like she's never seen here. Yeah. Wow. Oh, my. Yes. Yeah. We can't comprehend it. Today, mirrors are supposed to be for reflections, what we see in that. And our life is supposed to be like a mirror. People ought to look at us and see Jesus in us. Because if they don't, they don't have a problem. We do. Yes. Amen. Amen. Listen to what... Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse number 13. It's in red, so it's the words of Jesus. He said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is hence, thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of men. Listen to this. We're supposed to be so gigantic in our example toward the lost. But if we're not, we're good for nothing. We're the salt of the earth. Yeah. We're the seasoning that's here right now yeah. for the unbelievers. Yeah. Jesus goes on to say in verse 14, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. Why give your life to Jesus and never tell anybody about it? Why have the goodness of God in you if you don't want to pour it out on somebody else? Because people are hurting. People are needy. And they don't know where to go. But they ought to see that in you. They ought to see that in me. Jesus goes on in verse 15, continuing, but on a candlestick. Why? So people can see it. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Everybody around us ought to see the light of Jesus just booming, glowing from us. Yeah. And know that we spent some time with the Lord and they want what you have. Yeah. The Bible says freely you have received, freely give. Give his love free. Verse number 16. Listen to what Jesus says. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. There's people today says, once you get saved, if you're going to get to heaven, you've got to, you've got to have works. You've got to have works. That's not what the Bible says. It says you must be born again. You can go. But... When you get saved, you want to do something for him. 
You want to show others how much you truly love him by what you're willing to do for them. We have a young lady who I think it was uh, September or so. Her husband was a pastor of a church. I won't say where. And he had cancer and he was dealing with cancer for two years. And he had victories and he had setbacks. Victories and setbacks. And while we were home, we heard that he had passed away. Now, I'm going to really step on some toes. Maybe not in here. Maybe people will watch this later on. When a pastor dies and goes to heaven, we, the body of Christ, are responsible for that widow. Are you hearing me? We're supposed to take care of that widow. In, in some cases, they may not have any other family. We may be the only family they have. And so, I ask questions because I'm nibby, some people say. Some people say I'm nosy. Whatever you want to use, I don't care. I ask questions. I want to find out. Is anybody helping this widow? Is anybody doing their best to make sure that she doesn't go without? Because she doesn't have a job. She's trying to get a job and hasn't gotten one yet. So when I ask, I find out that there's one preacher someplace else that occasionally helps. Other than that, the other churches in the area aren't doing nothing. And they know this guy, knew the family. And I thought, well, why not? Why aren't you doing your best for this widow to help? So Liz and I, smaller ministry than most of these churches, decided to help. And so we've helped a couple of times. We're going to help again until she gets a job. We're praying she gets one that pays good. Working Monday through Friday so she can be in church on the weekend, right? Amen. We're being specific about that. But to me, when somebody, the Bible says this, to him that knows to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. You know, if you're supposed to be doing good and you won't do it, the Bible says that's sin. All I did was I was a messenger. I just transferred that word to you. If we have an opportunity to help somebody, especially a widow of a pastor, yes, by all means, do something. To show God's love. And what happens? Can I say it again like this? Remember I told you earlier? Food would come in our front door. Yeah. Would shovel out the back. It kept coming in the front. You start to help somebody else and God's always going to reply or replenish what you're giving away multiple times so you can continue to do that in other areas. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So since we're, as believers, the light of the world, our public testimony, our example of faith that others see in us. What do they see in us? I really wanted an answer. I didn't hear anybody say it. What do people see in us? They better. Because you know what? The Bible says this also. I always go back to the word. If you see someone has a need and you say, well, bless their hearts and just let them go and you don't help them, you don't have compassion on them, how does love, the love of God dwell in you if you're not willing to help those? That's what the Bible says. It's not my translation. That's what the Bible says in 1 John. If you don't have compassion on others, God's not going to have compassion on you. Come on. Because yeah. you reap what you sow. Yes, so. Amen. You don't hide your light under a bushel. We're never to deny Christ. When we hide that light under a bushel, it's like saying we could have been in the garden with, with Jesus, you know. We could have cut somebody's ear off. And later on, Somebody comes and says, I saw you with him. Oh, three times that guy denied Jesus. Yeah. The Bible also says 
Jesus saying to that particular individual by the name of Peter, he says, Satan desires you. He wants to sift you as wheat. He said, but I prayed for you. And when you are converted, he knew he was going to have a fall. He knew he was going to make a misstep. We all do. Not intending to, but sometimes we make a misstep. But we're never to deny Jesus. Let people know that you're proud to be saved and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And they can too, and then start to witness to him. I mean, what are they going to do? They're going to beat you up? Like up in Glendale, up around Phoenix area. Did you hear what happened up there? Preacher's out on the street preaching. Somebody come up and shot him in the head two or three times. For preaching the gospel. Guess what? It's a catch-22. If I stay here, I belong to him. If I go, I belong to him. That's right. Amen. And by the way, that preacher's still alive today after being shot in the head. See, I think sometimes people don't move out and do what Christ wants them to do for fear. Yeah. What would others think? Yeah. Well, you know what? I'm going to say it like we say it back, oh, I could give a rip. Yeah. Yeah. You like me or you don't like me. I don't care. I have an obligation to him, and then I have an obligation to them whether they like it or not. People must see the goodness of the Lord working in us and His goodness working through us. I'm going to come down there now, pastors. Okay. I'm a deer hunter. I like deer hunting. I just do. I like the flavor of deer meat. I just do. And uh, I've often wanted to go somewhere like out west and shoot a big animal because whitetail are good size, but they're not like a bear, they're not like a elk, a moose, you know, they're not like that size. And I heard that there was a hunting place in Ohio about two and a half, three hours from us, and I said, hey, I'm going to check it out. I checked it out, and they had a big old bison that weighed a thousand pounds. Huh. And so I said, I, I'd love to go there and hunt. And the price to hunt is only a third or a quarter of what it costs to come all the way out west to hunt and drive all the way back again. So it was a no-brainer for this guy. So I decided to take one of my grandsons with me. He wanted to go. He's not a hunter. Now after the hunt, he wants to learn how to hunt. I want to pass the skill on to my family. See, Walmart's not always going to have food on the shelves. You know? And so why not supply some for yourself? Amen. And whenever I harvest animals, I usually help about two or three or sometimes four different pastors. I give stuff away to them. Yeah. And things start coming back to us again. Yeah. It just works that way. Yeah. Praise God. And so I, I saw what they were asking for the hunt. I said, I want to go. And my grandson, Brock, he wants to go with me. And so we make plans to go for uh, mid, I think, mid-December of this past year. And they called like a week and a half before uh, uh, Thanksgiving and said, we had an opening. Uh, can you come uh, Thanksgiving weekend? I thought, that's my deer hunting. I really, yeah, I can do it. And so we made plans. We went over to this hunting preserve. And while we were there, we met four people from Indiana. I'm, I'm getting back to what I want to say, but I have to sort of set the table a little bit. Four people from Indiana, they were over there to kill meat hogs. I was there for a bison, they were there for hogs. And so when they got there, the first thing they did was they cracked that can, started drinking. I've been on hunts before, and I, I think the only thing these people know how to do is drink. Honestly. I didn't go over there to drink. I don't drink anyways, but I didn't go over there to drink, and I don't want to drink anyways and go out with a gun and try to shoot something. My, I'd be cloudy, you know, up here. And so they, they crack a can, they start drinking, they had some moonshine, they had hard liquor, and they drank most of the day on Friday. Okay, and we're sitting around the campfire, and all I hear these guys doing is cussing. Now, as big as I am, and I was the biggest there, 
I wanted to say something, but I just felt like it wasn't quite the time. So I bided my time on Friday. Saturday we get up. What do they do? They crack a can. They start drinking again. A couple hours later, they're up on the hill hunting. I hear four shots, four people. They come down. They took down four hogs. Wow, that's pretty good after all that liquor. I went up on the hill and couldn't find my bison. I mean, this is a thousand pound animal. Can't see it nowhere. And so we come off the hill, we walk down this flat place, and down the way about 190 to 200 yards, there he is. Well, it was a she, I was told. Big old horns and everything. And they said, oh, we, we sort of underestimate. I said, what do you mean you underestimate? It's not a thousand pound, it weighs 1,200 now. I look for more meat, you know. <laughs> and so I, I listened to what my guide told me. And I aim for the neck, but the thing is standing like this, looking at me, and I got like a sliver at 196 yards to hit an area like that. I shot three times and went over top of its head three times. Now I'm scrambling to put some more bullets in my gun. I get two more shells in my gun, and, and the guy pulls me over here, and I look like I have a better view of him, and I'm thinking, shoot it in the neck, shoot it in the neck. You don't waste no food, no meat. I didn't listen to that guy. I listened to my instinct. And I put it on it and brought it down to here and I shot it 196 yards. The dust flew. It walked over here, laid down and passed out dead. When they opened up this animal, there was a hole in the heart about like that. On the other side, it was that big coming out. So I hit it in the heart. Now, to be honest with you, I didn't say this is going in the heart. I didn't know. I'm just shooting the chest. That's where it hit. Amen. Now, I'm excited, to say the least. Because we walked these 196 yards up to this animal that's laying down there. And when I got up there and I touched it with my rifle, I could tell it was done. All the emotions started to fill me. Because, see, when I first started deer hunting with, with a bow years ago, 40 years ago, I shot a deer from up 20 feet in the tree. And I had a party. I started dancing 20 feet up in the tree. I'm glad I was tied off. <laughs> And I start screaming, and anybody else hunting, I've cleared the woods, you know. So I'm more than that kind of excited. And I start to, oh, yeah, let me tell you who I really am. My grandson looked and thought, what's he about to say? I said, I'm a preacher of the gospel. Oh, I started preaching right there with that dead animal at my feet. Because I felt the time was right. It wasn't earlier. I let them have their way. Hallelujah. Their eyes got this big. Their chins dropped to the ground. Amen. What? When we got back to camp, one of, one of the hunters from Indiana says, why didn't you tell me? I said, the time wasn't quite right. I said, but it is now. Yeah. <laughs> and they were good around the campfire Saturday night. Amen. They still drank, but their language cleared up immensely. And I didn't really feel like I was hiding what God had done in my life. I just was waiting for the right opportunity. Amen. Well, let me just say it like this. God puts opportunities in front of us every day. So when the opportunity is right, when it's time and you know the Lord's saying, go ahead. Yeah. What are you saying? What are you doing? Are you allowing him to come out of you to touch somebody else's life? That maybe they could they could go home and be in a car wreck the next day and split hell wide open. Did you tell them about Jesus? Did they see Christ in you? The hope of glory. Amen. I want to close with that verse of scripture that I was telling you in the book of James. I think I have it. Yes, there it is. James chapter 1, beginning with verse number 23. I want you to listen to this. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, how many knows we're supposed to do the word? Yeah. Not just hear it yeah. and say that that's only for that pastor. No, it's for all of us. 
He is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass or in a mirror. For he be beholdeth or observes himself. He goes his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. He forget what he looked like. Isn't that really strange? But look what it says in verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect, the faultless law of liberty, and continues therein. See, the thing of it is, we get saved. There's a work for us to do that we have to continue in. He being not a forgetful hearer, a heedless listener. There's some people today that hear the word and are not willing to do it. Not willing to put it into action. Faith in action in their, in their life. But a active doer of the work, in other words, this one will obey. What God says to do, they're willing to do it. This man shall be blessed in his deeds. His life will be a blessing, not just to him, but to others around him, if they're willing to do what an active doer of the word or work is supposed to do. So don't push it off on somebody else. The preacher, he's the one that preaches. That's his job. No. Don't put it off on the people that play the instruments and come up here and lead you in worship. Uh, will they do it? Yes. But it's not just their job. You have to be more than just a hearer of the word. You have to be a doer. You have to be active. If you're not willing to be active, look how much you miss out on by not willing to fill in a position that the Lord's speaking to you and that comes open in the church where you're at. Because he can't do it all. He'll do as much as he can. That's how preachers are. But he can't do it all. Faith without corresponding actions is dead. Let me say it again. Faith without corresponding action is dead. By hearing only, the person is looking into a reflection, but he's not willing to do anything. And he walks away and forgets who he saw in the mirror. Wow. One of the greatest transgressions of Israel, the nation of Israel, was hearing the law. And months later, forgetting what was written or what was spoken. If you don't take notes in church, you better start. Or you better go home and watch the YouTube again. The Facebook or whatever it's on. Go watch it again. Take notes then. Why? You're going to need them somewhere along the way. God's going to put someone in your path and you're going to have something to give them. Amen. Amen. The Lord's constantly in his word infusing this into our hearts and our minds. Don't forget my words. Put them before you. Let them be. The Bible says frontlets before your eyes. If you don't know what that is, get in the Old Testament and find out. Look up the word frontlets. F-R-O-N-T-L-E-T-S. Frontlets. Do a word study. That'd be good for you. Do a word study. Hallelujah. Find out what it means. Let that word be ever before you. You see, back in that day, Israelites would, would uh, have these little boxes. And uh, I forget what they called them. But anyways, it's not important. And they would, they would write down verses of Scripture, put it in these little boxes. And they would tie them around their head. And they had these boxes on their forehead. So they would not forget the word. I guess that was their way of taking notes. Yeah. <laughs> We're supposed to be always obedient. That's what it said in verse number 25. Let me go back there. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty continues therein, not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. What does that say? He's being obedient. He's doing what the word says to do. So I got a question for you this morning, or maybe several. 
When you look in the mirror, what do you see? Who should we see? Who do people see in us? I know I said I asked you a question, I asked you three. I might come up with another one here shortly. We must be a reflection of the Lord to this world that we're living in. And if we do that, others are going to want what you have. Yeah. I'm not talking materially speaking. I'm talking about the Jesus in you. They're going to say, what must I do to be saved? And you know what you can do? You can give it away. Amen. And watch the Lord continually replenish your supply. Yes. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Stand with me this morning if you would. Bear with me, I'm sweating. <laughs> so who do people see in you? I want to give a call for several things this morning. If you have issues in your body, you need prayer for physical issues, we want to pray for you. If you're bound in addictions and you want to get rid of them we want to pray for you Amen. if you're lukewarm what's the bible say in revelation chapter 3 yeah. it says i want you to be hot or cold but if you're lukewarm he says i'm gonna vomit you out yeah. plain and simple i'm gonna spew you out of my mouth he doesn't want us to be lukewarm he wants us to be hot or cold i think he wants us to be hot period or maybe you've never said yes to Jesus. This could be the, yes. the first day in a new life with the Lord Jesus leading you. Yes. And all you have to do, come on, Liz. All you have to do to him is say, yes, Lord. I've fallen short. I need a Savior. <laughs> and I'm coming to you because I need my life changed. And let me tell you something. Only Jesus can change your life. We can sing about him, we can preach about him, but it takes the Lord himself to do the work in your life. And if you're willing for that to happen, if you feel uh, fit in any of those categories, please come up. We want to pray for you. Amen.